All right, everyone, welcome to our Central Oregon Land Watch event, Flowing North. Uh, we'll probably have folks popping in and joining us right as it's just now six o'clock. Uh, but I'll go ahead and in introduce you to the folks you see here from Land Watch, and we will get started because uh, we have a lot to cover this evening. So I wanted to welcome you to this event, Flowing North, Rewilding the Deschutes. My name is Caitlin Burford, and I'm the Communications and Outreach Manager here at Central Oregon Land Watch. I am joined up here on the screen, you can probably see by Todd Heisler, our Rivers Conservation Director, and Covey Choksi, our uh, Membership and Engagement Manager. And many of you know that we were planning on hosting an event focused on the Deschutes for a while. We know the Deschutes is very near and dear to a lot of people's hearts here in this community. And early on, we weren't sure if we would be able to host this event in person or if we should stick to a virtual format uh, that we've learned through the pandemic. And a few weeks ago, Todd and I were discussing what would be the best format. And we thought about an outdoor field tour at the river. But last week with the heat and smoke, we weren't honestly sure that an outdoor event would be the best choice. So we went with a virtual format. So we're glad that you're here to join us tonight. And I'm really struck by this conundrum with, we were worried about an outdoor event with the temperatures as we've seen record breaking heat. Uh, we were worried about wildfire smoke that we knew uh, many wildfires are burning around us. And this is a really interesting question to have, to ask whether or not meeting by the river is, is safe with heat and, and the threat of wildfire. And I think that this event uh, speaks to the complexity of these issues. If we're asking these questions about the river and uh, safety for us, how is it looking for wildlife and for healthy ecosystems? And it's a really tough and urgent question and one that we have to ask. So tonight we wanna to spend some time uh, talking about the Deschutes and how we restore and protect this magnificent river that we hold so dear. At Central Oregon Land Watch, I know there's a few folks here that are familiar with our organization, but for those of you that aren't, our mission is to work within this region, the three counties of Deschutes, Crook, and Jefferson County, and our mission is to defend and plan for Central Oregon's livable future. And as a nonprofit organization here in Central Oregon, we hope that message resonates with our community of supporters. And while we have three different programs, uh, tonight we want to highlight our water program, our water and wildlands program, and bring in the focus on restoring our region's waterways, our rivers, and springs. And specifically at Landwatch, we advocate for both sustainable water policy and enforcing water law to the best of our ability in this region. So with that, I want to introduce you to Todd Heisler. Todd, again, as I mentioned, is a Rivers Conservation Director, and he brings a breadth of intricate knowledge on the Deschutes River and the Deschutes River Basin as a whole to the table tonight. So tonight we'll hear a presentation for him, from him, and then at the end we'll open it up for a Q&A with y'all, because we know there are lots of questions about what's going on with the health of the river and how can people get involved. So throughout tonight's event, if there are this presentation that Todd's about to give, if there are questions that come up during the event, feel free and write them in the chat. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll kind of go through those questions. Um, we'll also just have an open floor format where people can unmute themselves and uh, ask a question directly. But during the presentation itself, if you have those questions on the top of your mind, um, put them into the chat and, and we'll make sure and have that dynamic discussion. So with that, <coughs> Todd, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Caitlin, and thank all of you for showing up here on a beautiful evening. Um, I wish we were outside. Uh, as it turns out, there wasn't that much smoke, and it's the coolest day we've had in months. But we didn't know that, and I'm glad you're here with us tonight. So, um, so let's get started. Um, so here's the presentation outline. We're going to talk about the e ecological significance of the river, its current condition, the effects of climate change and drought, how we got stuck in an old paradigm of how we water, manage water, the plight of the junior water right holders, why this is all disconnected from today's economic reality, what the disincentives to changing this are, what some of the opportunities for fixing this distribution problem are, and a call for new water statutes for our basin. So there's a lot here. So buckle your seat belts and get ready for the ride. Here we go. So I always like to start with reminding us all that we live along the largest spring-fed river in the United States. It is an ecological marvel. 80% um, of the water that enters the Columbia River at the confluence was generated from groundwater. 
it's a, it's a phenomenal groundwater resource. And it's why we can have such a robust river in the middle of the desert where we get somewhere between 10 and 12 inches of precipitation a year. So we'll talk more about that, um, but just suffice it to say, this is, uh, this is a national treasure, this river. Here we are in the canyons above Lake Billy Chinook. This happens to be on the Crooked River side, but both the Deschutes River and the Crooked in the lower sections, just upstream of Lake Billy Chinook, have enormous springs that discharge very cold, pure water into the Deschutes River. And you can see in this chart how much we're talking about. So to the left, you're seeing Bend, and we'll talk a little bit why flows are so low below 100 CFS in Bend, but you can see by the time you get down to Lower Bridge, kind of Steelhead Falls in that area, the groundwater starts entering the system and you see over 400 CFS of water discharge and entering the river at that point. So it's a phenomenal spring-fed river. It leaves some sections of our river without water and others with bountiful water. So not only down in the lower section of the river do we have spring-fed, is it spring-fed, but of course Fall River itself is a spring creek, a spring river, and there are numerous springs on the upper, upper segment of the river above Bend, between Bend and Wickyup. So we're gonna talk now about the tail of two rivers. So as you can see here, this is the river that most people know. This is the river that a lot of people see, the thousands of people who come to Bend. I call it the splash and giggle section of the old mill. And in this picture, this is probably running somewhere around 15 to 1700 cubic feet per second. It's a very big, very full river. And that's because we're putting stored water on top of natural flow. It's an artificially high river, creates a, a superb recreational asset. But not far downstream, and those of you who've been to Riley Ranch, which is one of Parks and Rec's newer parks, it's actually a nature preserve, can observe the river downstream just a few miles from that last picture. And here we've got the river flowing at approximately somewhere in the 60 to 80 CFS. So we went from 15 to 1600 down to this low. And why? Because between those two points, virtually all the river, about 90% of the river is diverted out onto uh, in, in irrigated land through a number of irrigation districts. So these are the two rivers and they're very close. And a lot of people that actually grew up in Bend have no, had no idea that this was even the state of the river and people don't automatically see one that's so much bigger and this one and ask the question, how, how can this be and why is this? Um, so moving to the upper Deschutes, the, when Wickiup Dam was constructed in 1949, it changed the hydrograph of the river quite significantly. The natural flow, the unregulated flow is in that lighter blue line. And it's, you can see it's almost a flat line because of the spring discharge into the river, which really attenuates the flows. You don't have a flashy stream as you would find in many other places. It's just a consistent 12 months a year enter, um, discharging spring water into the river and it keeps the hydrograph relatively flat. But when we, built the dam, now we stored water in the winter, uh, and then we released the, that stored water in the summer. So the exaggerated flow of the dark line in the beginning of that curve is that unnatural or regulated flow of stored water on top of natural flow. And then of course we, we, we dewater the river while we're storing water in Wikiup Reservoir. So we have definitely messed with the hydrograph and we want to fix that, at least move it more towards natural. So here's the upper Deschutes, what I was just showing you in the summer, full of river, full of water, probably 13, 1400 CFS. And here's the same river in the fall after uh, irrigators turn off and they shut the river at Wickiup Dam. It's essentially a series of mud flats from Wickiup all the way to Fall River with these kind of perched grassland wetlands over to the right. 
um, which happened to be the home of the Oregon spotted frog. And you can see that most of their habitat has been decimated. It has caused lots of erosion. Um, it has eliminated habitat in these months. So the tail of the two rivers is, is depicted here. I haven't shown the blue whale in many years, but this is an old chart that I used to show all the time. The top of the chart is what we call the happy whale, the natural flow. Reading this chart from left to right, you go from the headwaters of the river to the Columbia River all the way on the right. And so you can see the, that the width of the blue line at any point along that continuum shows you how much water is in the river at that point in the geography. Um, and so where you see the whale fins mid, midway, that's where the Metolius River and the Crooked River come into the river, which is now down at Lake Billy Chinook. But what I also showed you were the summer flow impacts where there's essentially a hole in the middle of the river where 90% of the water is diverted onto the land, leaving those very low flows that I showed you down near Riley Ranch. And the opposite being true in the winter, when we impound the water behind three, behind three dams and three reservoirs, and we essentially dewater that segment. So we have seasonal discontinuity of the, the water in the Deschutes River, the tail of two rivers. So let's switch for a moment and talk about climate change and drought. Hopefully those of you on this program understand that this is climate change and we are in it and we are experiencing it. Experiencing it. I've been here for 18 years and I have witnessed this change in that short of time. But uh, what we know and what the best studies for our region, there have been a number of studies done in the Northwest with the Forest Service collaborating with Northwest Labs to really kind of downscale some of the bigger regional models to understand what will be the impacts here in the Northwest. And specifically the numbers that I'm showing you here are for the east slope of the Cascades in Oregon, right where we are. So what we all know, I think by now is that we're gonna experience decreased snowpack and earlier snow melt. So this will change the uh, magnitude and timing of the flows into our river. We, so we'll actually have higher flows in the early spring, late winter, and we will have lower flows uh, in the late summer. And then of course that's problematic because there's the highest demand for the water is in July, August, and maybe the first half of September. And we're going to experience stream flow reductions of up to 40 to 60% in the Deschutes River by 2040, if, if, if the forecasts hold, but I suspect they will. I like this picture. It's actually south of here. It's Shasta Lake. So California, of course, has a very similar problem. But here's back, here's Wikiup Reservoir. This was taken um, last fall, somewhere around in first week of November. Um, Wikiup is, is a very significant problem. It, um, and here's a graphic of it. The full capacity is in the light tan. The June 2020 is that sort of olive color. You can see the arrow. And in June 2020, which is very early in the irrigation season, a reservoir that holds at full capacity 200,000 acre feet of water was already at 90,000 acre feet on June 20. You fast forward to this past June, and these are the data that I took was June 15th of both years, it was already down to 50,000 acre feet of water. The reservoir was at a quarter of its capacity in relatively the start of the irrigation season. So this is a, this is a really significant problem and it's significant in a lot of ways, but mostly for, we'll be talking about the plight of the junior water right holders who rely on this water for agriculture. So our problem really started a long time ago and we are still stuck in a very old paradigm. This is a picture of uh, Tumlo Irrigation Districts, Columbia Southern Canal, which is actually a retired canal now, being dug um, probably around the turn of the 20th century. Um, but we are still living with not only the infrastructure 
but the policies of the late 19th century. Um, and these are the things that we have to figure out as a society how to change. Um, so just to give you a quick example without any one of these could be its own presentation. That Federal Carry Act in 1894, really for the first time it allowed states, the federal government said, we wanna reclaim the desert and we wanna settle everything. And our process at the federal level is not fast enough. So we wanna allow states to acquire up to a million acres of public land. So we're gonna give the public land, federal land to the states if they can make it agriculturally productive. And to do that, then they allowed private companies to build irrigation systems and to profit from the sale of water. Well, those irrigation systems and that profit from the sale of water are today's irrigation districts. And so it really started there. Then in by 1909, the Oregon Water Code came into existence because frankly, it was a free for all for water then and no structure and nobody knew whose water, who, who got the water and people were stealing people's water and it was a big mess. So the, the Oregon Water Code was established and I find the, the irony of the very first thing in the code is that the water belongs to the public, but essentially they already, they already gave it away to private companies to build irrigation systems and profit. So the water never really belonged to the public even though that's the, the premise of the Oregon Water Code. And the, the water rights and permits to use the public's water were assigned by the state. And of course they assigned it in a system that is called the doctrine of prior appropriation, which is first in time, first in right. So all the way back at that time, Swally Irrigation District right here in Bend, got an, it was an 1899 water right. And you can see the irrigation districts. These are all diverters on the Deschutes River. Um, and North Unit Irrigation District at the bottom has a 1913 right. That sounds kind of old, but given the number of the volume of, um, of water rights that were issued, we call it over-appropriation. Um, the North Unit 1913 water rights are actually very junior. And I don't believe that they've ever gotten the full face value of the water rights that were issued to them in, in 1913. So this sets up a pecking order that tells you whether you need to really worry about water or not. And if you're at the top of the list, you're pretty much gonna get your water all the time, drought or no drought, climate change or no climate change. But as you go down there, you have increasing water scarcity um, and insecurity. And so just so you, this is a chart from a few years ago, but um, so you understand in the basin here that that bar on the right is irrigation district water. They still control by far the lion's share of the water. So the city of Bend's water on to the far left is its small fraction. Um, all of the public drinking water supply um, in the region is still small. And a little bit of on-farm irrigation from groundwater is very small. So the other uses of water pale in comparison to the water that the districts have. It's important to know that because a lot of, it's not that conserving water in cities this is important, it is important. But where the real work is to save the river is over there on the big bar on the right hand side. That's where we can make huge gains for, for everyone, thank, frankly. So we're gonna drill in a little bit. So, so North Unit Irrigation District, of course, is around Culver and Madras. And since they had the most junior water right, they are the most um, efficiently run systems, not perfectly efficient, but, but compared to all the other districts, they're leaps and bounds more uh, efficient than the other districts. A, because they're in business to actually grow something and sell it and have commercial farms, have productive agriculture, and B, because they have a junior water right and they have to care about that. Um, Central Oregon Irrigation District, on the other hand, ha has been and continues to be highly fragmented. Um, there are very few large farms left. So when you look at their 24 or 500 some odd patrons, that's the number of people who own water within the district, half of those irrigate three acres or less. We call those hobby farms. And then if you look at the acreage, not the patrons, but what's the acreage, 80% of the acres within the district 
are divided up into parcels of 10 acres or less. So we, you know, over the last 50 years, we've had highly fragmented landscape in, in COI. And, and as a result, quite frankly, um, you know, it's not a pro very little productive commercial agriculture going on um, in that area. And so this year, climate change, drought, it's perfect storm, and, and junior water rights, perfect storm for North Unit. These guys are absolutely hurting. They didn't have enough water even to get a lot of plants in the ground, which would hold the soil. So they have bare soils, erosion, topsoil loss, weeds, and it's just, it is a, it's a tragedy in the making. These guys are really hurting. Um, and it really doesn't have to be this way um, because it's really a distribution problem. It's not absolute scarcity. Um, so here we have in senior districts, we have water that flows all year, all, you know, from April to October. It's like turning on the, the garden hose in April and turning it off in October. We just let the water flow. There's a lot of flood irrigation. There's um, inefficient ditches, nothing's lined, nothing's piped. There's inefficient uses. Um, and it's the, because they have a senior water right and the volume that they're allowed to get under that water right doesn't incentivize any level of caring or conservation. And there's not much of a culture of conservation within these districts because their main job is to make sure that water gets put on the land so they can protect a water right. So this is why I call it, it's a distribution problem rather than one of scarcity. Most of you have probably read in the papers, uh, the scenario in the Klamath. The Klamath is true scarcity. Um, you've got you know, two tribes at opposite ends of the basin that need water for different species of fish, need significant volumes, and you have a monstrous appropriation by the Bureau of Reclamation for irrigators and farming which for years was fine and now is not. So here we have the plight of the juniors. I, I talked to you about how North Unit Irrigation District has this junior water right. Um, well, the funny thing is the river has a junior water right too. Um, in 1987, the state passed legislation that allowed the water, ironically, to have water rights. And so Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife went out and filed and got water rights in a lot of the streams, including the Deschutes, but they're very junior. They're 1993. So they're even nowhere close to the 1913 of North Unit, but they are junior. So I think there's an alliance to be made here between those who care about the water and getting its junior water rights fulfilled and those who care about real farmers and having theirs fulfilled too. Again, a distribution problem. Um, so the water distribution system is broken and it no longer serves our two, two of our big economic drivers. These are obviously not the only ones, but two, two big ones, agriculture and tourism. So let's have a look at that really fast. So North Unit, this is a comparison of North Unit Irrigation District at the top and Central Oregon, Ir Ir Central Oregon Irrigation District at the bottom. And what we see here is that North Unit puts 61 million gallons of water on almost 60,000 acres and produces $67 million of gross farm product per year. That's actually Jefferson County, but essentially that's for North Unit, Jefferson County, that's synonymous. Central Oregon Irrigation just puts 100 million gallons of water on 45,000 acres and generates only 29 million in gross farm product. And that's in Deschutes County, which is bigger than COI, so it's not absolutely analogous there, um, but it's close. So then if you actually look at these as gallons per acre, you see in a normal year average at the top, COID, would put 2.2 million gallons of water per acre. Um, all of that 2.2 million 
doesn't actually make it to those acres because they lose so much in transmission. But as a, as a for, diverted from the river, you can, you can account for 2.2 million acre, gallons per acre. And North Unit, only a million. So less, well less than half. But in a drought year, that gets even worse because the junior water right, North Unit continues to fall behind in what it can actually get from the river. And at this point, you can see 1.7 million to 500. So now COD is getting over three times the amount of water that North Unit is because of how those water rights work. That's why it is broken. And if you just look at you know, the farming economy, Deschutes County is roughly 70,000 irrigated acres. The net income, not the gross, is negative. We lose money on farming in Deschutes County and we lose it at about $13,000 per farm. On Jefferson County, about 60,000. The net income is $12 million and there's a net income per farm of 31,000. But Jefferson County can't get the water that it needs to stay in business. Tourism too, whether we, you know, no matter what we think of this splash and giggle and other amenities and assets, it's one of the major things that attracts people to this area and has them either stay here or move here. So it's a huge driver. This just happens to be travel impacts, some statistics from 2014, but even then, so $531 million of gross or 153 million in net. So we've got a system that's it's broken. The distribution is skewed towards things that, are, that don't support our economy, our lifestyle, our culture of the 21st century. So how do we change it? We need to change it. So it's important to know what the disincentives to change are so that we can start to go to work on those. So the EFU tax break is, is a huge one. It's a, um, EFU means exclusive farm use. It's part of our land use system, which is good. It's great that we designated farmland as exclusive farm use. Nothing wrong with it. That's excellent. Um, in fact, those, those laws of course are, are set to help protect farmland and forest land all throughout Oregon. And it's done a great job over the last 50 years. But one of the little problems with it is that if you have exclusive farm use property, you get a pretty major tax deferral or tax break. And that made sense when they enacted the law 50 years ago. But when you look at the fragmentation of the land and the growth of hobby farms and the non-productive use of the water, you end up with a lot of not productive farmland in EFU that's still getting tax breaks. And if they want to change it and start put, putting water in stream, which I've had a whole bunch of people ask me about, they get penalized because all of a sudden the county considers if they put water in stream that they're no longer farming and now they have to pay back taxes of 10 years. So it's a, suffice it to say it's a big disincentive and something that we should address. The other thing is that there's just district pressure, use it or lose it. There's not a culture of conservation that says, hey, we've got a problem here. We've got farmers that need water and we've got other parts of, we've got rivers that are really hurting. Uh, we need to share the water. Uh, no, instead, they're, they put a lot of pressure on their patrons to use it all in every single place every year to protect what's called the beneficial use of the water right. We need to change that too. There's the entitlement of seniority. I think I've really already explained that. If you're a senior water right holder, you don't have to really worry about whether you're getting your water. And so that why would you ever change? Why would you spend anything to change that when it all flows to you pretty much every year, including this year of severe drought? Um, and then the last, I think, uh, important one is that, uh, of course, the, the water code is based on the premise that you put water to beneficial use without waste but there's hardly any criteria for waste and there's certainly no enforcement of waste. And so at this point, it, it's not considered waste just to dump water on the land, just to protect a water right. And I think that needs to change too. So fortunately, there have been great studies. I was involved in this Upper Deschutes River Basin study. It identified lots of really exciting opportunities for projects. Um, 
and it includes piping district canals and the laterals on the private land and doing on-farm improvements and market-based incentives, which is basically offering financial incentives to change people's behavior uh, and new reservoirs, which was sort of the least attractive of all of those things. So the ones that are highlighted in yellow are clearly, if you look at the cost of them, what they generate, uh, they generate a lot of water, potential water for redistribution at a very low cost. The districts are primarily focused on piping their canals, which is number one, you can see that it's six times the cost of private laterals and you know, over 10 times the an order of magnitude more than market-based incentives. So we need to find ways to bring some of these cost-effective methods in, you know, make them real, uh, bring back a water bank, which we used to have to do, do market-based incentives. There are some opportunities here for redistribution um, and the studies are there and actually we know how to do it. So this is my la last slide and this could be its own presentation. Um, so I won't try to delve into this to too much detail, um, but suffice it to say, as I went through the presentation, I was telling you the things that needed to change. And I used to be one that said, it's a waste of time to try to go to Salem and get anything changed. But I think given climate change and the crisis that we have for the rivers and our real farmers, we have an opportunity at least to go try and get some of these century old policies and laws uh, tweaked and, uh, and improved. So one thing is that we wanna redefine beneficial use to mean really productive agriculture, not dumping water on non-productive land in order to protect a water right. Seems clear to me. So we also wanna more clearly define waste and enforce it. Um, and there's waste all over the place. You just have to drive around and have a look at water just running everywhere. Um, we wanna allow transfers of partial water rights. This is a little techie geeky, but right now if you transfer a water right, you have to take the whole thing off the acre and to dry it up completely. Well, most, that's a disincentive for most people who may be very willing to use less water, but they don't necessarily want it completely dry but under this part of the statute, which is called enlargement, and it was put in place for a very good reason. What they didn't want people to do was to say, oh, well, I have this water on this acre. I'm just gonna go and spread it over to this other acre, even though that acre doesn't have water rights because the water that goes to that other acre should go to the next junior user down the line instead of being spread on that other property. So that's why it exists, but to get water to junior water right holders and in stream, I think we need to change that. And we talked about exclusive farm use, where if you were to lease your water in stream, the county will tell you that you're no longer farming and lose your tax deferral. We need to make water leasing an official farm use so that doesn't happen. We need to streamline the interdistrict and in-stream water transfer processes to make it easier to get water to, to redistribute the water. And frankly, one of the ways to do that is to establish a state water bank authority where water can be acquired and parked and then redistributed according to you know, a, a set of authorities that, that would basically get more of it to highly productive uses and to the river. So there you have it in a nutshell. Um, I think it's a, it, it, we face a lot of threats, but I think there are a lot of opportunities. I think there are a lot of people who I've talked to who are interested in really stepping up and saying, we're just tired of the way this water is managed now. Now's the, now's the time we should do something about it. So I appreciate your patience and thank you very much for coming tonight. And I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah. Um, before we're going to open it up now for questions. First of all, thank you so much, Todd. Um, I feel like I could spend a long time looking at any of those graphs and images. And after this event too, to everyone here listening, I'm gonna send out a follow-up email uh, that includes some of this information. It'll include a recording of this presentation as well as we can include some of those graphs there. Um, so hopefully you'll have this as a resource to take this knowledge out into the world. Um, and we have, have a couple of questions that have come in on the chat, but before we do that, I wanted to share with you uh, while Todd was talking about the sort of tale of two rivers, I know many of you all have probably experienced that going to parts of the Deschutes uh, that seem 
full and overflowing and then going to visit other areas of the Deschutes where the water, you know, is, is barely more than a trickle. And uh, we took some video footage in May, right when this sort of distribution uh, problem is at its height. And I wanted to share those with you um, because I think it really is telling to kind of compare the two, the two rivers next to each other. Um, so with that, I'm going to show you a view. Both of these videos were taken on the same day in May, and this is uh, the flow at Benham Falls. So listen to the noise, look at the water, and kind of uh, understand what the Deschutes River looks like uh, just south of Bend. Can you all hear my sound? Okay. <laughs> I can't hear the sound. No, I can't either. Okay, so you could hear that, right? <laughs> yeah. Took a little while, but you got the visual and the sound. And then here is the same day, same river, Riley Ranch, just north of Bend. So you can kind of see and hear and feel the, the, those two rivers that Todd spoke about. Um, so with that, let's get to some questions. Um, there's one in the chat that I'll read out now to Todd. And then after that, put your questions in the chat. You can also raise your hand if you're familiar with that feature and I'll call on you or um, I'll open up the floor and you can just unmute your microphone and speak directly uh, to the audience. So our first question, Todd, um, it's from Sam Lowry, Samuel Lowry. Do the necessary policy and legislative changes have any true champions in the Senate or the House? <laughs> Not yet. Uh, you know, I, I, they, they know certain parts of this. And so I think there's still a long way to go. I think we have to really start at the beginning. Um, but uh, I've been talking to a number of people locally about really getting our local um, getting Kanop and get, getting up really all our local reps first, totally in line, and our county commissioners, and um, and then going to some of the more sympathetic years in Salem. But we really haven't started that. I, I expect to start working on that pretty much at the beginning of the new year. Yeah, uh, there's a great opportunity there to make our representatives champions by reaching out. And if they're hearing from us, especially some of our new elected officials that really do want to represent us the best they can, it's a great, great time to, to, to leave a public comment or send an email to both our commissioners and our representatives. Um, yeah, to direct us there. Yep. Uh, Natalie has asked, has Central Oregon Land Watch taken the lead on introducing legislation along the lines of the solutions you introduced, or do you plan to in 2022 or 23? Yeah, no, we, we have not. This would actually be a new area. We've just been talking about it internally. Um, and I think for a long time, as I suggested, we thought, I don't know, it's just the, the time and effort um, and maybe the futility of the effort would not be worth something for the small organization to take on. But I think we're really starting to figure out now how it might be possible. So we're, we're at the bare beginnings of, of putting this together. Um, and I hope that we will actually, will take a leadership position. We're still kind of formulating that now. Um, there's two questions. I'm going to, one came through direct message. I'm going to read it and then answer this other one. Carolyn asked, do you, or Carolyn Wise asked, do you have information on how to reach representatives and where do you start? Absolutely. Um, I can try and find some of those links to put in the chat right now, but in tomorrow's follow-up email to y'all, I will definitely include some of those names and contact information, um, to do that. And then our second one is what are the effects on the fish? <laughs> Yeah, so um, we have, we're gonna have some really big problems for the fish with that, with the stream flows falling in the summer, 40 to 60% by 2040. 
that's that's going to shrink the usable habitat, the cold cold water habitat for those fish. So, um, you know, frankly, they're going to try to move up higher, I suspect, but it's it's going to shrink the habitat and therefore going to be a big problem for a lot of fish, I'm afraid to say. Um, it's why we need to, so one, one of the things we're trying to do are, you know, like connect Tumlo Creek to the main stem of the Deschutes. Tumlo Creek has cold, clear water. Much of it is diverted by Tumlo Irrigation District. We're trying to get to reconnect by acquiring and through other means water to reconnect that last two miles to offset some of the adverse effects that we're going to see through climate change and to really help those fish and to give those fish a place to go um, you know uh, to seek in the cold cold water refugia of places like um, Tumlo Creek, White Juice Creek, the same thing. We're going to really have to count on our tributaries, our cold water tributaries, in these bad times. All right, y'all, the floor is yours. Who has a question while you have Todd's expert water ear? Okay, there's another one in the chat, but I always want to give everyone a chance to speak if they'd like. Um, are there any comparable watersheds anywhere in the U.S. for which concerted and collaborative planning have completely rewritten an historic distribution regime such as we need here? That's a good question. Oh, that's a great question. Um, so not exactly, right? So um, there's been a, a lot of collaborative efforts that have, that have done good things. I used to sit on the uh, you know, west wide water panel that looked from Colorado to Arizona, California, <clears throat> Oregon, Washington, Idaho. And everybody was experimenting mostly with, the, with sort of the incentive based side of this, not the, we've got to pipe this or that, not the infrastructure side. And I think everybody believed that that had a lot of promise and probably the, the most promise of any, of any technique because of its the incremental nature of it, the relatively low cost. Um, so there, there are a few successful models, but nobody has, has fully you know, solved this problem. I, I think the Yakima Basin straight north of us is one of the most successful. Um, and because they were able to get their irrigators, tribes, environmental organizations, and other key stakeholders at a table, they, and when they came out with their plan, at first I thought it was kind of almost ludicrous because it was so big and it was so complicated and it was so expensive. I think it was two or $3 billion. And, but then you realize that their ag sector is two to $3 billion. And then you realize that because they all work together, they got their county commissioners, their local reps, the governor's office, their congressional delegation, all in line. And they started to get hundreds of millions of dollars of state and federal money to go and, and, and replumb their basin and, and put in, you know, really work hard to fix a lot of these problems they have. So I, I look to them as, as probably one of the most successful. None of them are perfect and none of them have come to you know fully to fruition but i think that one shows that is a powerful model for bringing people together and leveraging the resources um, to really invest in the changes and so i think the yakima is probably the answer yeah that's a good answer i think this isn't a direct answer but something you said todd i think is hopeful i think a lot of people when they hear this information feel really you know, they're like, how do we fix it? But just thinking about this as a distribution problem rather than a scarcity problem, and just recognizing that if it was a scarcity problem, our work would be much harder. And the fact that it is a distribution problem means that there is some sort of collaborative hope. And um, if there's places like the Yakima Basin that have done it to a large scale, um, there are solutions that are within reach. Yep. Uh, Susie, there's two more. Susie asked, uh, is the Oregon Natural Desert Association on that board with this cam campaign? And if so, what's their response? Or how do we collaborate with other uh, sort of similar partners? 
Yeah, so we, um, well, first of all, we, we don't have a, a specific campaign yet, but we will, be, we will be formulating one and we will definitely be working with ONDA, Environmental Center, all of the other local organizations for sure. Um, I know Ryan Houston, their director very well. He and I worked very closely together for many years. So we, we have a great working relationship and we will continue to partner. I think maybe more, even more important, and what I guess I'm suggesting here is that we're going to get some odd belt bedfellows together in the political alliance, and it's going to be the farmers themselves, because at some point here, they have nothing more to lose. And what I didn't explain, and probably should explain a little bit more, is that there's a big water exchange between North Unit and Wikiup Reservoir in the Upper Deschutes. There's already a plan in place that has North Unit providing water, a better hydrograph in that upper to shoot second section of the river that I showed you. So it really is true that if we help those farmers, we help the river, there's a direct tie. Um, even if there wasn't that absolute direct tie, we have them as political allies now um, or, or potentially do be, because of their situation, because they're basically in the same position the river is as a junior water right holder. So I kind of think that that's going to get the attention. That's going to maybe help get us political traction, that just having a band of an alliance of environmental organizations would, would have a harder chance to get the traction. So we'll see if I'm right. I mean, there's a lot of pitfalls to putting that together. But I know when we talked to the governor's office about drought declarations and putting stuff in about sharing water across districts and and that they should be more flexible and they should be working better together. Um, the Farm Bureau was was very supportive of all that. So so I, I think we have a chance, but absolutely ONDA will be one of our partners for sure. Yeah, I think it's easy, especially looking at some states in similar plights to see water as the great divider. Um, but when you're in a crisis, water is also the great unifier. And there's a lot of people that are concerned for very different reasons, whether it's recreationists, fishers, anglers, um, conservationists, farmers. Yeah. Um, okay, our next question is, why not attack the use it or lose it aspect of the water waste in, in isolation? From my perspective, it's the most abusive aspect of water waste here in Central Oregon. Totally agree with you. Um, and in fact, the um, the state the water resources um, and the attorney general for Oregon I think it was in the late 90s early 2000s essentially said as much is that you don't have to use all of your water um, it, because it not not all the time every year I mean if if you fail to use your water at all silch, don't use a drop of it for five years in a row, yes, that's forfeiture. But um, they made it clear, but the districts aren't, aren't picking this up, that no, you won't. We want you to use what you need. And we want you to actually conserve water and we want you to use less water. Um, and we want you to do that in a manner that will keep some water on the land and that where you won't be losing a water right. So. I totally agree that that's, that's a big problem. And it's part of the mythology that the districts are spreading. Um, I've done presentations in the past, I may pull one up of, you know, the myth busters. There's a whole bunch of myths out there that are perpetrated by districts and others to keep control of the water. They want everybody to believe that that's true because their system, which leaks like a sieve, does function better when those canals are full up to the brim and just let that water rip and they're going to get it all the way out to Powell Butte or all the way out to Terrebonne. So it is true that, that their system works better and therefore they want everybody to, they want to divert all this water and they want everybody to use it. Um, and because the system works better that way and they protect their water rights from forfeiture if they can get everybody to use it. Now they don't mind going in and confiscating people's water rights for non-use, but they won't go in there and tell them to use their water more wisely or, or to, to implement conservation. 
So that's the other big, big problem here. They're, they're working the beneficial use side, but not the waste. Um, and they're promoting it through this use it or lose it. So I agree that myth has to get busted. Um, and we really have, that's, that's very important, I agree. It's shocking how often you hear that use it or lose it so commonly used. Yeah. All right, y'all, we have a little bit, we have time. I'm gonna say two more questions. <laughs> Who's ready? Ecosystem health, watershed storage, wildlife questions. <laughs> and facts about the river. That might be it. We might be at the end of our questions. Well, I, I, I appreciate everybody's interest. And, you know, if we're successful in making a political movement out of it, we'll, we'll be, we'll, we hope we can count on you. And it will require a lot of citizens effort to talk to the, the politicians. And I think one of the exciting things, at least in this idea, and it is only an idea, is taking the conversation above all the water geeks, frankly, like myself, and all the water tech people, and getting it up, getting it to the political level where the people can get educated and then hopefully we can we can work on some solutions, have a different conversation about it. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming tonight. I hate to do this to you, Todd, but we actually just had two last questions come in. So let's oh, answer. I can answer questions all night. Are you kidding? <laughs> we have the time. Okay. Uh, the first one is, um, could you speak a little bit to riparian restoration and a different question, but connected, don't they need to keep water at a certain level for the spotted frog? Oh gosh, well, we could have a whole conversation on the spotted frog. The answer is yes, but it's, um, what's the big, so riparian restoration is ex exceedingly important. And if we just for a moment, for time's sake, we'll focus on the upper Deschutes River above then. So that, as I showed you, that riparian habitat has been, in many cases, completely destroyed. And they've pushed the frogs way back and up into sort of what we call perched wetlands. And so the challenge is, how do you, on the one hand, you need the water to get really high to get up to those perched wetlands. But on the other hand, you need to change the flow regime in order to recruit vegetation back down into the floodplain. So it's this sort of paradoxical world that we live in in repair and restoration there. And I think there's a fair amount of disagreement about how one should do that. But at the end of the day, for the frog, the frog is an aquatic amphibian that, needs to, that lives in water for all of its life stages. And it needs to live in vegetation, um, which is where it, it gets cover and where it gets nutrition and oxygen. And so we have to, uh, and most of the spotted frog habitat has been decimated on the upper Deschutes. So we really need to, you know, carefully, uh, you know, change that hydrograph. I think it should, my philosophy is we need to gradually do it. Um, and then the important thing is that you, you get the water levels in the spring and you hold them. You allow the, and basically in the upper Deschutes, they need about 800 CFS flowing to reach some of those important wetlands. And then they need to just hold it there for the breeding season, which is a couple months long. So there are things that we can do for the frog and need to do for the frog. I won't get into the current habitat conservation plan, which I think misses the mark in a number of ways, um, but it, it's, it's trying to, and it's trying, to, it's trying to address what's a very complicated restoration ever Effort, given how decimated that riparian habitat is today. Yeah, yeah, we've, um, I'll include this in the email that I send out to y'all tomorrow too. There's a couple of uh, pieces that Todd has written about the spotted frog specifically um, that we've sent out in different emails and different articles um, that really dive into the, the spotted frog and exactly kind of what's happening with the riparian habitat. So I'll be sure and share those with y'all as well. Uh, Last question, this one is a hard one from Grant Buchanan. How can we better encourage the younger generation to have a voice in this issue? This is what I'm working on also. So Caitlin is our star performer who's been with the organization for a short time. 
I, I think I think we will. We have to. I totally get what you're saying. Um, we all do it in our own ways by taking kids out on the river and having them appreciated at its core level in the field. But obviously, we can't get to everybody that way. And and I know that Land Watch, um, and frankly, Caitlin in specific is you know works on these communication strategies and in manners in which we can actually reach those audiences. Um, and it, it is a it is a challenge. I would absolutely agree with that. And and very much necessary. One thing that I think can really help is I think there is a deep cultural change in Central Oregon that needs to happen where I think many people look at the Deschutes River and assume that uh, its flow fluctuation is is natural. And I have been a part of that as well. Um, I grew up here and it wasn't until recently that I realized that this the the low flows in the winter and the high flows in the summer are not, you know, natural. And I think a lot of people think that because many rivers are as snow melt affects flows, many, it's very normal for many rivers to be really high in the summer and then, then lose that flow. Um, but learning, you know, the Deschutes river is spring fed. It's not, um, primarily snow fed. It should, it should have a really stable fluctuation. So even just changing in conversation, the way you talk about the river and just knowing when you look at the river banks in the fall or the spring, and you see, you know, six to eight feet of, of dry area that should be, you know, the, the side at river's edge or the large mudflats, just knowing that that is not natural and that that's not part of a natural process, I think is really eye opening. And I think many people, I may be wrong, I don't have studies to prove this, but I think many people in Central Oregon, especially new to the area, don't know that that um, isn't isn't natural. So I think even just in conversations and letting people know, people that love floating the river, spending time on it knowing that what we're looking at is, is a, a hurt, a very hurting ecosystem. And then people start to realize that the river isn't healthy and want to figure out how to get involved. So when we do get into these really complex solutions, whether it's changing water policy or, um, or otherwise people are ready and willing to learn because it's hard. It's not easy. There's not like a quick fix of like, turn your water faucet off while you're brushing your teeth. And if we could fix it in that way, we would, but because it is so complex, we need people that really have a stake and a care and concern. So yeah. yeah, that's my easy answer is building that knowledge and awareness that the river is not okay, um, I think is the first step. Yeah, so. it's interesting that you said that, Caitlin, because when I first started into this business, I gave a lot of presentations like this and I had old timers come up to me and said, what are you talking about? It was, it's just the river gets dry in the summer and we used to walk across the, the middle to shoot. So that's what they thought was, he had no idea that the districts took a thousand CFS, 1500 CFS out of the river right upstream. They just, there was no awareness of, the, of how the river was managed by people who lived here for a long time. And obviously the newcomers. And, and so we have to bring our young, the young audience along with us too. Um, and I'm, I'm encouraged to see, you know, so I'm an, I'm, I'm an older white guy and I'm sort of just trying to do what I can here towards the end of my career. But Landwatch is now full of young folks who it's, a, it's an honor to work with. And um, it's just, it's a wonderful organization uh, that I've been with for a couple of years. And I see the sort of the changing of the guard to the, to the generation uh, the younger generation, I think it's a very positive trend in our organization and hopefully we can have an effect in a broad way. Yeah. All right. Well, I am going to wrap us up so that we can get you out of here on time. Um, and again, I'll share that information with you tomorrow in the chat itself. I'm going to send out an email. Um, if you ever have any questions on our water issues or our other programs, if you send an email to info at colw.org, um, we will make sure and direct that, that inquiry to whoever can best answer it. And we are happy to, to do that. Um, and if uh, you specifically are interested in uh, becoming a member or a supporter of Landwatch, um, you can do that on our website or Covey who's with us tonight is our membership and engagement manager. And I put his email down there too. It's Covey at colw.org. And uh, Covey is, is making sure that Landwatch can continue doing this work because we think that um, it is important. Um, also, if you all are interested in kind of keeping up on some of our communications that we send out, whether 
whether it's information about the, um, or articles on the Deschutes River that Todd writes or some other things that we're working on. If you put your email in the chat, you can do it privately to me. Um, I'll make sure that you're subscribed to our email newsletter that kind of goes through. And especially as we look towards long-term um, solutions for the Deschutes River restoration, we'll need people and supporters to take different actions, um, to, to reach out to local politicians, et cetera. Um, so, so keeping up with our work and, and being able to kind of be a part of those larger movements is really helpful and really what we hope for in this organization. Uh, thank you so much. I think with that, we'll wrap it up and look for an email from me tomorrow. And thank you so much for being here and for all of your wonderful questions and for caring about this, this river. Thank Thanks, you. Todd. Thanks everyone.